Good evening all, and welcome. There are many strange creatures across the globe that are unidentified, and that are the stuff of nightmares that many people have claimed to see, as we are about to find out. So I hope you're ready, because it's time to get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. I am from Alaska. I was born into the Togatelli tribe in the center of Alaska in 1980. This is about 50 miles south of Fairbanks in a small town called Nenana. There are several other tribes in the immediate area, and long ago there were far more before Russian and American settlement. I don't want to identify myself on accident, in case anyone from here ends up hearing this, but suffice to say that paranormal experiences are natural and expected as part of my ancestral heritage. As a child, my grandparents told my father strange stories of the stickmen, who were eaters of men. They especially loved the flesh of children and newborn babies were considered delicacies by these spirits of the forest. One time when Nanana was first being settled by Gusok, white people, there was a hunter who came from faraway lands to settle the wilderness of Alaska and hunt its bears and moose. He took a small party of hunters and native guides into the forest, deep into the countryside to the marshes, where moose and bear frequented. Far down the Titana they went, shooting every animal they saw, squirrel, moose, wolf, porcupine. The natives were silent and led the men on, afraid to question their violent, wasteful ways. Until late one evening, the hunter called his party to set up camp and rest. They chose a quiet spot in a field, where they could see all around them in case wolves decided to try and sneak up and they rolled out their blankets after dinner and went to sleep, leaving some to take turns watching for animals. The hunter had fallen asleep quickly, content on his bed of furs and blankets. He had dreams of sunny days, perfect for hunting the famed grizzly. He was awoken by the sound of cracking sticks. He found this odd, as they were in a field, but perhaps it was the men rekindling the fire. He peeked out of his tent to check on the encampment. Horror of horrors. There were pools of blood on the ground, but no corpses. He watched as a man bundled tightly in his blankets was lifted up by what appeared to be many small moving sticks and carried off towards the edge of the camp. The man woke up from the gentle rocking of his convoy and screamed alerting the remaining hunters in the camp, who jumped up and reached for their guns. They were quick to draw, but were confused by what to fire at, as mostly they just saw sticks on the ground moving in ways that were impossible. They decided to run, because there was nothing clear to shoot at. But as they ran together, they were chased by giant animals that appeared suddenly from the tall grass. The hunter waited, until the men were being chased by all the animals, then jumped from his tent, and without looking back when he heard their screams, ran as fast as he could. A week later, he showed up in Nanana, crazed, exhausted, and on the edge of death. He related his story and then perished, for he would constantly wake up screaming if he tried to sleep, and thus could not rest. A version of this story is common in my family, though some details change with the storyteller. My father has seen the stickmen on a hunting trip, and like this apocryphal hunter, he has been crazed and terrorized by the memory ever since. It is said that though the stickmen go by different names and come to people in different shapes, that there is some regularity to their appearance. They generally come as either sticks, which blend in with trees, or the ground until you come upon them, or they can visit you as an animal. This animal is usually described as either a large deer or a small moose, which can move incredibly quick 
for how awkward it seems to be hunched on its legs. They appear as pale or white animals, and though they usually do this to intimidate men and women, they are hungry beings who feast on the unwary. Seeing a stick man, one may be haunted for years or their entire life afterwards. But in some cases it is considered good luck, as if a stick man is uninterested with you, it means that you have powerful ancestors surrounding you. You can usually anticipate the arrival of a stick man, as the entire forest will go quiet around you for as long as they are in the vicinity and sometimes they will speak to you and to each other. When this happens, they sound like a raspy whisper, mixed with the rattling of dry willow branches, a light chattering. Do not camp where the forest is silent, and do not look into the eyes of the stick men, for they will drive you mad with fear. I have never seen these spirits personally at least, I can't be sure. My only experience with one potentially happened outside of Carson City, Nevada. I was driving alone in a big Ford pickup truck late at night, when I noticed what originally I took to be a deer on the side of the road. This was no deer. It ran like a dog or cat, staying close to the ground in a liquid motion, whereas a deer would bounce or gallop as they ran. It also moved upwards of 30 miles an hour, and when it turned and ran down the hill, I realised it was much larger than almost any deer I'd ever seen, yet lacked antlers. Please, ask your questions if you have, and feel free to share your own experiences below. When I was 13, my mum decided I would be going to military boarding school. It was located north of Mexico in a place called Durango. Durango is known because it is home to many creepy things, drug cartels, the zone of silence, ghost towns, UFO sightings and the like. I was in that school for around six years, and one day a friend invited me and other students to go to his hometown to have some tacos with his dad, a well-known rancher. When we arrived to the town, we were on his house having some drinks, and eventually he decided it was time to go. We hopped into his pickup truck, and he began driving right when the sun was setting. After about half an hour, everything was dark, and he had to turn on the headlights. I was on the front seat with my friend, and we've just arrived to the place. He slowed down his car, and we could hear the nocturnal wildlife and some scratches on the car from branches and plants. The headlights allowed us to see just enough to distinguish shapes. He stopped the car right in front of a little lake, and we could see some bushes and trees around the water. A few meters in front of the right headlight, we could see what we thought was a rock. The guys started unloading the truck while they joked around. My friend and I were still in the front smoking, when all of a sudden he said, Did you see that? While he pointed to the rock in front of the car with the tip of the cigarette. That just moved. Since I've always wanted to see something paranormal, I remained still. We were both looking at this rock, when all of a sudden, the thing turned its head to face us, with, I thought, what looked like the face of Gollum. Big, round yellow eyes, and arched back. And I turned to my friend, he grabbed his gun, and quickly got out of the car and fired two shots into the sky. All of this while people are still unloading the truck, and making a fire for the grill and such. I heard a few scream. I saw how this creature looked up to the sky, turned around, and hopped into the water. Right after that, everyone began asking, what happened? My friend told us that it was actually a common sight. He explained that his father and grandfather often saw the creature when they were hunting. He said that they called it Hombre Rana, or Frogman. Just a few of the guys saw the thing. We still had the tacos and everything, 
We were a little creeped out, but we assumed that the frogman was probably more scared of us than we were of him. I saw many terrifying, creepy and odd things in Durango, but the frogman takes the cake. I'm a big outdoorsman from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So of course, when I decided to go to college, I had to keep in mind that having some decent woods nearby was a must. Upon checking a couple of places out, I decided to go to Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania, or just the borough. The biggest plus about going to that university is that my uncle Fred lived up there and was a well known name in the community. He owns to this day, a framing shop right in the middle of the small town area. This was a huge plus since knowing people like that always equals more land to put spots in. That's all I really needed to pick the college I would be going to. Edinburgh is really cool because there are lots of old buildings and strange flat landscapes as compared to the hilly land around Pittsburgh. So it was cool to figure out how to scout the game that I'd be going after once the season started. My main hunting area was directly behind my uncle's house. He has a beautiful log cabin that sits back off the road with woods on all sides of it. It was truly a thing of beauty. When he had the house built, he actually had the gigantic chimney made of flat stones that we found in the woods behind the house. As I was scouting the area for the first time, I came up on a few different circles of boulders in the middle of the woods. They were definitely very old. The boulders were quite big, much too big just to be moved there for some reason, like a group of guys came camping out. They must have taken at least 10 men to move, and only if they'd have had some kind of pulley system or something. There were also smaller rocks, and when I say smaller, I'm talking like somewhere around 300 pounds or more, making inner circles inside of the large boulders. I found a total of seven of these stands throughout the property. Some of the rocks that were now part of the chimney, they simply had to be with the amount of rocks he used on them. Oh, and also these rock circles had made a much larger circle around the woods. After a few more days of scouting with my buddy Brandon, we were sure we had our spot picked out for our first day of archery. We couldn't wait to get out there. Perfect day too. It was great. The thing about Edinburgh is that it gets more snow per year than most of Alaska, due to the lake effect snow coming across Lake Erie. What happens is before the lake freezes completely over, the water which is warmer than the air pushes the clouds way up high into the atmosphere, too high for them to actually snow due to the low temperature all the way up there. The clouds then come inland and fall back towards Earth. It takes them about 20 miles to do this, and Edinburgh is about 20 miles from the lake. You see what I'm saying. Anyway, on the first day of archery, which is in the first week of October in Pennsylvania, there was a thin layer of snow. This is perfect for archery, because you can see deer in the woods much more easily, and you can also see if any animal has left any tracks. If they did, they were fresh, since the snow didn't happen too long before that. In our trees for about two hours or so, neither of us had seen anything. I had just gotten off the radio with Brandon, who was on the other side of the property, when I see some movement over to my right of the pine thicket. I then see a branch move a little bit, and see four deer legs underneath. I readied my bow and my stance, as to make a good clean shot at the deer. Around 15 feet up in a tree, I did this very carefully. About a minute later, as I was looking for any movement, I lost the four legs inside the thicket. This was expected due to the fact that where the deer would have been is a common feeding area for them. So I waited. 
Maybe another minute or so later, I caught movement again. It looked as if the deer would break through the thicket into more open woods. The movement I've been waiting for. As I brought the bow up into a full drawn stance, I was stunned by what I was seeing. Where the deer should have been, there was a man. A strange man at that. This absolutely should not have been. If there was a man anywhere near where that deer had been, the deer would have been long gone, spooked back into the thicket. I put my bow back down onto the hook that I screwed into the tree, and lifted my binoculars to my eyes. At only 35 yards away, I could now see in great detail his physical appearance. He was rather rotund, with his belly leading the way. A white, long-sleeved shirt, on with ruffles down the middle, just like the pirate shirt in that one episode of Seinfeld, if any of you have indulged. It was tucked into thick canvas brown pants, with pants being tucked into white socks directly below his knees. Further down where his shoes should be, there was absolutely nothing. He had no feet whatsoever, no calves, no shins, no shoes. And with my eyes wide open, I mouthed to myself, what the hell? Instead of walking, he seemed to float through the woods, going from right to left. This is when I started noticing other extremely strange things about him. I looked through the binoculars at his head. It was cocked back with his chin resting down on his lower neck. His very large, red, bulbous nose up in the air. A bit of a snobby overall look. The hair though. It was covered by a wig that judges in England wear. A white wig with three curls on the side of it, where his ears would have been. I noticed that he didn't seem to float through the woods. He was floating through the woods. His arms stayed tucked at his sides, unmoving as he traveled. He also never looked down. The way his head was cocked, he could have only been looking upwards. This is not any person or animal, as they'd be constantly looking down and around for obstacles that you might trip over. All of this happened within a period of about 20 seconds. He had come out of the thicket behind a medium sized oak tree. Then when he hit the next oak, he never came out from behind it. I watched in absolute astonishment for another five seconds waiting for him to break his cover so that I could see him again. This never happened. I told Brandon what had just happened, and was immediately made fun of. I expected that was what would be coming through the radio after I got done talking. He was just saying I should have taken a picture of the only deer slash human or minotaur remaining in the world. I told him he won't be laughing when the deer tour came over to his tree stand and smacked his ass right out of it. Even though it was in the middle of the hunt, I had to get down and see what the hell just happened. I knew where he would have walked. Not only would I see his footprints in the snow, but it would have also been very easy to see even better tracks due to the fact the area we were in was full of muddy ground. A freaking hummingbird would have left tracks in this muddy mess. As you probably guessed, when I go over to the spot where he had been, there was nothing. I saw not a single track from him, nor deer, nor anything. I was utterly amazed. What happened later that night was just as creepy. So after I was done checking out the muddy snow ground where the man should have left some kind of footprint, I went back to my tree stand and climbed back up to the height that I'd been hunting from earlier. I radioed Brandon and told him I was back up the tree and secure. We always did this as a precaution, in case something happened while we were climbing the tree, or securing the platform of the portable tree stand. My old man's buddy, Bunky, actually saved his left eye from being completely blind and useless. He was practicing shooting from a raised platform when he slipped and fell off, driving a stick right into his eyeball as he hit the ground. 
This has nothing to do with the story, but all of you hunters out there should adopt this practice. You know, the more you know. Anyway, we're hunting the rest of the day, but not without periodic raging from Brandon, making fun of me and the deer tool throughout the rest of the hunt. I knew I'd be hearing about it for at least a week or longer. That is, of course, if the rest of the night would have been a normal one, which as it turns out, it was not. As twilight approached, I radioed Brandon and told him I was going to start getting out of the tree. Brandon was actually in a built stand that we found while scouting in the months prior. So I had him meet me at my spot due to the fact it was going to take me much longer to get my stand down and off the tree. Just as I thought, Brandon was walking up to my spot, right as I was getting to the bottom of the tree. Once I got all the way to the bottom, I unhooked the straps that were around my feet, jumped down to the ground and started feverishly explaining to him everything that happened. I took him over to the muddy area to show him that there were absolutely no tracks in the snow or mud. I definitely could sense he didn't completely believe everything I was telling him. I was able to sense this so easily because he looked right at me with his mouth agape and his eyebrows pushing up towards the middle of his forward and said, are you messing with me, brother? He was also able to tell that I wasn't messing with him. When I looked at him, in what I'm sure are some of the craziest eyes he's ever seen and said, hell no. When he realized I was 100% serious, he started taking inventory of all the things that I had previously told him. And we went back and forth trying to make any kind of sense of what I had witnessed. While we were talking to each other back and forth, we had failed to notice that nighttime was already upon us. It was that Stephen King full dark, no stars kind of night too, due to the fact that we were looking for signs left behind from the ghost guy. We were in a patch of woods that we weren't very familiar with. We may have been pretty close to where my stand was, but once night falls in the woods, it's a whole new ball game. Still, the patch of woods we were in was enclosed by a triangle of roads. All we had to do was walk in a straight line and we could come out somewhere on one of the roads, then just walk that road back to my uncle's house. So we began walking. Walking in a straight line in the woods is almost impossible without a compass, which I didn't have. So we were both figuratively and literally in the dark when it came to where we were. A couple of minutes into the walk, we heard a loud scream as if someone were being murdered. Now I know what every animal in the wood around here sounds like, both normally or in panic mode making death cries. I see videos often on YouTube of people recording a sound in their backyard that they think is a person who needs help, only to be a rabbit screaming from being attacked by some predator. This was not that at all. After waiting a couple of minutes to see if the screaming would continue, we started walking again in the direction we thought we should be going. We didn't talk much about what we had just heard, probably because of the anxiety we were both feeling. We couldn't ignore it for long though, because we heard another long blood curdling scream. It was closer this time and sounded different. At first we thought it sounded like a woman being attacked. This new scream sounded threatening. Ironically, we felt like we were the ones being stalked and hunted at this point, and we still pushed forwards. After walking another hundred yards or so, we came across something very strange directly in our path. There were these weird, clear gelatinous masses on the top of leaf litter. Now I'm at 32, which isn't an age that necessarily screams wisdom from my experience but I've been in the woods since as far back as I can even remember. My old man taught me everything there is to know about the wilderness around us. So take it from me, these clear globs should not have been there. The only thing I could think of was that it was tree sap, but it wasn't. I poked one of the masses with a stick, fearing what they were made of. 
I had read a story about a town that had clear gelatinous globs rain down on them. A lot of these people got very sick. And if I'm not mistaken, I think even a couple of them perished from it. So needless to say, I was taking precautions. Their consistency was that of a thick gelatin. Like if you made jello with only one cup of water instead of two. Once we started walking again, we came across a good amount of this stuff. It wasn't all over the woods. Instead, it was directly in front of us as we walked, almost like something or someone knew which route we would try and take and marked it with these globs. Then came another scream, this time even closer and with a little something added in. This time, not too far away from us, we heard leaves rustling and a couple of twigs snap. Something was definitely there. It could have been a deer, but this was unlikely. Whatever it was, wasn't spooked at all. Not from us or the threatening scream. It's easy to tell when you've spooked an animal when they start running. On top of that, most of the leaves were still very moist, therefore not making as much noise as they normally would. This sent our anxiety level through the roof. At that point, the only thing that was on our mind was getting the hell out of there. We were no longer curious about floating men, screams or alien jelly. We just wanted out, which should have been very soon. The distance we walked should have come across a road by now, but we hadn't yet. Stranger still, we couldn't see any houses or street lights, but still we kept going, thinking we'd find our way out very soon. Our flashlights were now beginning to die, so we were definitely in a hurry. Which, by the way, is not what you should do if you were ever even lost in the woods. Cool heads always prevail in this situation. As we were walking, we started to see some pine trees. This was very strange, because we had thoroughly scouted the land. The only pine trees were over near my stand where we started. After seeing a few more, we got that foreboding feeling, almost like a sick, anxious panic feeling. We stopped for a minute to check our surroundings and found that the exact spot that we stopped was the same spot we started. We were standing right next to a pine tree with a dead pine next to it that had a branch broken off and dangling still from the severed limb. How could this be? We had been sure we were walking in a straight line, but that must have been an impossibility since we made a circle. We had no idea whatsoever how this happened, especially since we were in the exact spot we started from. Also very strange, we had seen my tree stand that was still hanging on the tree. It was very close to us, but when we started to walk out, it was nowhere to be found. We walked over to it and immediately found the trail that we had to take to leave the woods. It led directly back to my uncle's backyard. The trail actually went right past the live pine tree we had been standing under. There is no way we had missed that from the start. To add more to the strangeness, as we walked only about 20 yards down the trail, we see plainly my uncle's light that he had above his garage to illuminate his driveway. Our minds were blown, but at least we were able to get out. On the last hundred yards of the trail, we found more clear gelatin blobs directly down the middle of the pass. This was definitely crazy. They were not there when we walked in. We had both been on the trail when we entered the woods, and we would have seen them for sure. We heard no more screams after the time we heard the rustling of the leaves and the twigs break. But we had a strong feeling of being watched when we were still in the woods, and an even stronger version of the same feeling as we stepped onto my uncle's backyard. This is at the top of my list for scariest experiences in the woods. I've no explanation for any part of it. Not the floating ghost guy, not the screams or the globs, not the getting lost in the woods, and not the circle of boulders. I would love to hear from anyone who has had anything like this happen to them. 
There has to be some kind of answer. But at this point, all I have is my story about what happened that night. And thankfully, one other person who went with me through it. At least he's been able to validate what happened to people that don't believe this actually happened to us. Whether you believe it or not is up to you. But I can assure you this, it happened exactly as you heard it. I know it sounds crazy and outlandish. But it happened. And that's a scary thing to think about next time you guys find yourselves in the woods. Something incredible had happened back there. I'm thankful that we were able to get out of the woods without having anything bad happen to us. What it did was made my wanting to understand the paranormal even stronger. One day I'm going to go back there alone and camp for a night or two in the hopes that something happens again, and that I have the strength to seek out whatever it was and get some answers. I live in Russia. And my encounter happened around a year ago in February. I was walking by the embankment at 10pm. It was already dark, and nobody was around. There is a road which has three levels, a big street. Then it goes down into a smaller one. And finally the embankment which turns into a small path through thick snow. Just imagine you're walking through an industrial area which barely has streetlights, no people. And on your left, there is a little forest. And on the right, there is a river. So I was walking on the path when I saw this man. His whole appearance alarmed me instantly. He had skis on, but was trying to walk as he was without them. In the deep snow, it was around his knee level. And I saw how much effort it took for him not to fall and carry on moving. There was no way to avoid this person. Because it was a tiny path through the snow. He was staring at me smiling. I'm unsure if it was in a predatory way. But something was strange in the smile. I thought well, if anything happens, I can push him and run and carry on moving. When I was right next to him, this happened. Everything took place in about three seconds. I was watching his every move with my side vision. And in one moment, he vanished. There was nowhere to hide. The trees give you at least a 100 meters worth of visibility. And hiding in the snow isn't an option. You would be visible regardless. He was gone. I slightly turned my head to that direction when I captured something right behind me. A stick man. It was absolutely black around my height, maybe a bit taller, very thin, with a big head and no neck at all. It was standing in a very threatening position with its arms set apart like an animal preparing to attack. This figure looked like a picture printed straight onto the air. I thought the 2D object should be material at some point with the thickness of a sheet of paper, for example. But no, this looked entirely different. I turned my head away and started running to the second level of the road. When I got there, I looked back. This thing was peeking out of a tree. And when I spotted it, it hid behind it. At this point, I really thought that I was going to die for sure. And when I got to the third level, some cars were driving by. So it calmed me down a little. I looked back. The stick man was standing in the spot where I was a second ago, right in the middle of the road. The whole landscape looks so unreal that at some point I questioned my sanity. This time, I kept the contact and tried to examine the thing. The stick man was slightly moving back and forth. But its whole body had a very stable dark black figure. I got a feeling the feeling saying that I shouldn't be seeing this. Then my survival instincts were blurring out of my mind that were telling me to flee. And it was also a feeling like he's found me. Imagine the feeling when you play hide and seek, and your cousin is very slow finding anyone. So you sit somewhere for 20 minutes. At first you feel the pleasure from the game. 
But then, as time drags on, you get bored. And when they finally find you, it's almost like a relief. I think that something tried to stop me from walking away, because at some point there was a little desire to approach it. Anyway, it was obvious that it was following me. And the thing is, I lived very close to that area. I didn't know what to do, either to wander through the streets so it would lose me, or go directly home. But this thing would know where I lived. I decided to run to safety immediately without looking back. And yes, that wasn't the end. That night, I had sleep paralysis. I remember laying in bed listening to the sound of water from my aquarium, when it suddenly stopped. I thought someone was trying to grab my attention. So I opened my eyes, and right next to the bed was the same black figure. This was it. The end of my life. I literally saw my entire existence flash before my eyes. It stood three feet away from me. And then it turned in a fog, and started to fill my lungs through my nose and throat. When it was entirely inside my body, I awoke. Or I didn't sleep at all, I don't know. The thing is, I haven't noticed any difference with myself since. This whole encounter was very different from anything I've seen in my life. There are things you've never experienced before, so you don't actually know what to think or feel, and are filled with curiosity. I am low-key disturbed. Would I one day find myself in the middle of nowhere approaching a random person with the skis on, and disappearing next moment? Did that dream mean anything, or was it a dream? I barely remember that man's face. This has been a terribly odd and confusing experience. And if anyone has encountered anything similar, I'd love to hear about it. So that I know I'm not the only one. Years ago, when I was 13 years old, I went on a trip to celebrate Easter with my mum's family. It was a tradition for us to go have a picnic in the middle of a big field, 40 minutes from my grandma's house. The field is basically in the middle of nowhere in rural Mexico. That day, my cousins and I got very curious about a small hill we could see from the field. It always caught our attention because it looks like a giant took a big bite out of it. I know it used to work as a rock mine several years prior. And anyway, we decided to go investigate and left the picnic. We walked for 20 minutes until we crossed a road and went up a hill. Once there, we started looking for a way to trespass a metallic fence that kept us from going into the actual mine, and eventually we found a hole in it. My cousin was recording with her cell phone as we were making jokes and acting like normal cringy teenagers. When suddenly she froze and whispered, Hey, there's something in the rocks. And she pointed her camera to the rock wall behind us. At first I thought she was joking, but something about her expression seemed off. So I turned back, and there was a human dog-like hybrid looking at us from a hole in the rocks, about 20 to 30 meters above the ground. It had pink, pale, and wrinkly skin, and a long snout and long ears, white eyes, and hands with long fingernails. It had no hair, and it kept still just watching us. After what felt like an eternity, the weird creature finally went into the hole again, and we started running back to the picnic spot. We showed the video to our family right after being scolded for going so far without saying anything to anyone but you could barely see anything on the video. After all these years, I still don't know what that thing was, and I get goosebumps when I think about it. The mother of my best friend had a brother working on that mine in the 70s or so, and she claims that he and other workers died there, but the families never got the bodies back. Apparently rocks collapsed multiple times, killing the people working, and making it very difficult to retrieve the corpses. Well, that's what the owners of the mine said to all the families involved. After a few incidents, they decided to close the mine for good. 
In college, I lived up on top of a mountain road, but still only five minutes to tow down a trail through the woods. There was a hundred plus year old oak in the yard, slab stone porch built by hand. I lived in the studio apartment that was outside the main house. The main house was haunted, but my shack was cozy. The woods up there were weird too. I've never really been in the main house, after all. But the three who lived there said some nights you couldn't sleep from all the noise, the floorboards creaking, the thumps and knocks. My experiences happened outside. Like I said, I hunted small game up there, as there must have been a rabbit colony in the vicinity, plus a few squirrel drays. Often out there while I was stalking, I'd get the distinct feeling of being stalked myself. Keep in mind, this stand of forest is only several acres, but it was preserved mainly because of the historic oak trees scattered about. It's old woods. I would hear laughter, like children's laughter, but not quite like in a creepy movie. It was a bit distorted, and almost like flirty giggles that you might imagine a fairy make. It would come from a different location each time I sought it, and I eventually decided to stop following it and hunt. It never did stop. I would sometimes spend an afternoon in town having drinks or hanging at my friend's place. I'd finally leave and have enough liquid courage to hike back up the trail in the dark. That laughter would be replaced by noise, just like things running all around you and dashing about the trees. I've been an outdoorsman for a long time, and I know the woods are noisy at night, particularly in the Southern Appalachians. But this was different. It was dead silent out there in that stand at night, except for this rushing to and from by some unseen feet. Not like game fleeing, deer run away and crush about doing it. These steps were like something or things running swiftly around me. It's like it would cross the trail ahead and then behind me, and then alongside me, but I would never see it. I was a big time night owl back then, and was regularly up doing schoolwork into 3 or 4 a.m. One such night, it had just snowed a fresh 20 inches or so, decent accumulation for the area. Our yard and the woods were like a paradise for me and my dog. I was excited to hunt around the next day for tracks, and see if I could locate the rabbit den precisely. I was up working and the dog came scratching to get me, not frantic or anything. I let her in and she lay down to sleep. Odd because she's a husky and preferred the snow to my tiny heated apartment every time. I decided to call a night too and went out for a cigarette. It was 3.24 am. I can still see it on the top of my MacBook display before I closed it. I went out, noted the clouds were dispersed a bit more, and the moon was bright on the snow. I lit my cigarette, and was just looking out across the fence and into the woods, when something caught my eye. It looked like a silhouette of someone leaning against one of those big oak trees, like you'd see someone with a palm planted against the wall, with one arm straight out leaning against it. It's not moving, so I can't tell if I'm just tired, or if the lighting is funny or what. So I walked further to the end of the porch, and as soon as I stepped onto the fresh snow, there it took off. The thing was tall. My estimates based on the tree put the thing at seven feet tall. It ran along the border of the fence, and back off into the woods. It was hairless as far as I could tell, and completely naked. Otherwise though, its form was just that of a skinny tall man. I went inside and switched to boots, grabbed my rifle and my flashlight, and I went to check the tracks. I picked up a set of what had to be at least a size 14 or 15 barefoot. It ran along the fence and down the treeless stretch of backyard as if heading into the woods, but then the tracks ended about 20 inches short of the wood line. I don't know if they managed to jump to the tree line, probably because there weren't any more tracks that I could find that night, 
or the next day. It's like it just completely vanished after that. Wyoming is one of the largest states in America, covering nearly 98,000 square miles. Despite its size, Wyoming has less than 600,000 residents, making it one of the least populated states in the US. Its history is rich, and is as dark as the coal that fills the endless stream of boxcars winding their way across the western plains. Many battles, and a great deal of blood has been shed, by both the white man and the Native Americans, in the fight over the lands and its resources. So as you can well imagine, many residents believe the land is cursed. There are countless stories of paranormal activity, from ghost encounters, Bigfoot sightings, to skimwalkers and cryptids alike. Not to mention stories of UFOs and alien abductions. This story, however, is not about spirits, or anything of that nature. As a kid, my family would often go camping at Lake Desmet, just outside of Buffalo. These camping trips often included taking the boat out for some water skiing, and or fishing. On one particular trip, my father and I were fishing in the middle of the lake. The water was so calm and still, it almost resembled glass. The glare from the midsummer sun's reflection off the water was nearly blinding. Still, we talked lazily about everything and nothing. I recall my father commenting on the fact he thought it was rather strange the fish were not biting at all. He stated it as if something had scared them away. I didn't give what he said much thought, as I was preoccupied by the sudden ripples that began to dance across the water, giving the lake's surface a funhouse mirror effect. I recall thinking it was rather odd for this to be occurring, considering there was no boat or anyone in sight for that matter. My heart began to pound in my chest, as the ripples soon turned to waves that slapped against the side of the boat, with enough force to cause it to rock back and forth. Judging from the look on my father's face, I could tell he too was feeling uneasy about the current situation. Dad? Are you seeing this? I asked, trying to keep the fear from creeping into my voice. I am, is all he could say, his eyes nervously scanning the lake. I should point out that the lake is said to have a depth of 70 feet on average, and 130 feet at its deepest. Others say no one knows how deep it truly is. There are countless stories regarding a creature known as Smetty, Descriptions of the cryptid are as varied as the sightings. Some describe it as a giant eel with a horse-like head, while others say it resembles an enormous alligator. Most witnesses describe the monster as a classic Loch Ness monster-style creature. Now keep in mind, I had heard all of the stories and truly believed they were just tall tales. However, all the doubt I had was blown out of the water as I watched what looked like the head and neck of a massive sea monster rise out of the depths, about 50 yards from the boat. As we watched in silence, the creature lazily drifted across the water as if it didn't have a care in the world. Needless to say, my father and I were peeing ourselves with excitement and fear. It was my father that first broke the silence. Well, I'll be damned. It does exist. Yeah. Neither of us had thought to bring a camera, so there was no way to capture a picture of the encounter. To be honest, even if we would have, we were both so shaken I doubt either of us would have gotten a decent picture at all. We just sat there staring in awe and disbelief for what seemed like hours. In truth, the whole encounter lasted maybe all of two minutes, before the lake creature disappeared beneath the lake's surface. My father and I looked at one another without speaking, 
and quickly began reeling in our lines. Well, I guess I know why the fish weren't biting, I pointed out. Indeed, my father replied, with a slight shiver. I think it's time for us to get the hell out of this lake, he suggested. I nodded my head in agreement, and without another word to my father, cranked the boat's motor, and we hauled ass back to shore, cautiously keeping an eye out for the monster. I've been back to Lake Desmet many times since, and have yet to see the creature again. However, sightings and stories continue to circulate. Although there is no actual proof that Smetty exists, I know without a doubt that it indeed does. If any of you have seen it or heard about this elusive creature, I would love to hear from you down below. I was visiting my cousin's house. I have four cousins, two twin girls aged 10, and then the older brother aged 21, and other older brother aged 26. I was sleeping in the room with the cousin of my age, 21. We heard things falling in the girl's room, right next to where we were. We assumed it was just them playing, but one of them started talking to the other, and they were across the room. So my cousin stepped out of the room to go check, and I watched over his shoulders through the doorway. Right as the girls were explaining that stuff was falling without provocation, a sort of humanoid type thing came bursting out the closet. It looked humanesque, but was much longer and thinner and ran on all four legs. It ran out the house, broke the front door hinge, and straight through the screen door. We called the police immediately, and they were there within five minutes. They looked in a five mile radius and nothing was found. They gathered DNA from the door, as apparently the thing was cut by shattering wood on the door, as there was still a small amount of blood on it. They ran tests, and it was determined to be inconclusive. They said it was similar to human DNA, but not in the way ape DNA is similar. It wasn't a human though, they knew that much. So to this day, we have had no incidents with whatever this thing is. They still live in the house, have no problems, but we have zero explanation for what happened, and what the thing was, and how it got into the house. Out back of my own 30 acre property, there is a big grove of eucalyptus trees. I was walking out there to get to the river because me and my friends were going to drink some beer and generally chill by the river. But when we walked by the trees, that I've walked by thousands of times before with no weirdness, I thought I saw a little kid peeking out from one of the bigger trees. So, I told my friends to look right there where the kid or whatever it was, was hiding. And about a four foot tall humanoid thing peeked out with its pale white like grayish color. It had a weird head and honestly that's about as descriptive as I could be. As the moment I saw it, my hair stood up and I ran as fast as I could back to my house to grab a gun. We still go past those trees to get to the river, but never do so without firearms. I wish I had not been so scared, because I feel like I should have filmed it. This is a story relayed to me by my father. Many years ago, he was doing a road trip of the States. He was driving along one night, determined to stay up. He'd been driving for about five hours, and it was approaching midnight. Exhaustion and fatigue from the day had been getting to him, and he was starting to feel the strain at the wheel. Every moment was another fight against sleep, and he kept his eyes open, determined to stay awake, for his destination lied 
only a half hour away. He thought it best to pull over for a brief respite. So he pulled over on the side of the road. It was a fairly desolate place, and there were no other cars. He stopped, looked about, and it was pitch black. The moon was high in the sky. But other than that, it gave very little light for this surrounding area. He got out of his car, reached it into his pocket, and fumbled retrieving a cigarette box, pulled out a cigarette and lit it. While sighing deeply, he really needed to make it that next half hour. As he stood there, thinking about what he was going to do tomorrow, and dreaming about the comfort of a bed for the night, did he hear something in the distance? He turned his head and didn't see anything, and just ignored it, assuming it was the sound of the wind. He finished his cigarette. He stood on the ember, and just as he was about to open the car door, did he look around again? That's when he saw it. The moonlight was reflecting, and there was something in the trees, something vaguely humanoid shape. He tried squinting. Was it a person that needed help? Why were they not approaching? But moreover, why were they standing there creepily, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night? When he realized just how odd this was, did my dad quicken his pace, threw open the car door and closed it, feeling safety within his vehicle? He didn't even do his seatbelt up. He tore us out of there quickly and started making his way to his destination to get some sleep. He looked in his rearview mirror after a few seconds and didn't see anything, and a surge of relief washed over him. As he carried on with his drive, did he occasionally glance in the mirror? And after a few minutes, he noticed it. It was following him. It was matching his speed. He was going at nearly 60 miles an hour. How could this creature be keeping up with him? My father thought he was going mad, but dared not stop to pinch himself and verify this. He put his foot on the accelerator and pumped that machine harder. 70, 80, 90 miles an hour. His car was now really suffering, yet this creature seemed not to stop. Its speed matched the whole time, and as my father was putting his foot further and further, to the point where it wouldn't speed up anymore, he swore he thought the creature was gaining on him. My father was absolutely bricking it. Fear, panic, and terror all consuming him within his mind. His glances back to the mirror were now frequent. His fear was overcoming him, his heart was racing, and he didn't know what to do. And just as quickly as it had started following him, did the creature vanish. It must have run off into a bush or something, or realised my father wasn't worth pursuing. He didn't stop. The speed he maintained he carried on for several hours. He decided to forget about his little hotel for the night and kept on driving until he reached his friend's place. He passed out when he reached his house, about 8am the next day. The fear fueled him all night, and he told me that he would never visit that part of the States again, and warned me that if I were to find myself down a lonely road in the middle of the night, to keep going, and to be wary of my surroundings. Who knows if that creature, whatever it might be, is still out there. How it could reach those speeds, he doesn't know, and he doesn't want to find out. He's just grateful that he got out with his life. This story 
has been passed down through my family. They called it the Indian's devil. All I know is that my great 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 grandfather was courting his wife and had to walk 12 miles up the old island road. The story goes that something jumped out of the trees at him. It had the hands and feet and face of a man, but the body of an ape. It followed him for miles, mocking him and then running away. The local Aboriginal people call it a devil and always told their children to stay close or it might snatch them. They knew this thing. So I asked Grampy what happened. And he said that my great 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 grandpa was so upset that he took to his bed for four days. He then got a bunch of men together and they tracked it down and shot it. Hey guys, it's Mort here. And thank you so much for listening. I do hope that you enjoyed tonight's collection of stories. I feel like today we had a very nice variety from where these stories came from. Certainly some spooky cryptids that I'd never heard of before. The stick men. Genuinely didn't know about that one. Did you guys know about that one? Leave a comment down below. Did, did you honestly know that those existed? I'd never heard those stories before. So for me, it was incredibly interesting. I'd like to see more Stickman stories, maybe have a whole video on them. They seem really, really interesting. In any case, I do hope that you enjoyed tonight's installment. If you did, you can let me know by doing the usual stuff that everyone you watch will ask you to do. Just a little reminder. As always, a huge thank you to my incredible patrons and for everyone who is supporting me. Links, I mean names, can be seen on screen. And if you'd like your name on screen, you can help chip in with as little as a dollar a month. It goes a long way in to help keep things going over here. And of course, is tremendously appreciated and is not without reward, of course. For signing up, you get a few little cool perks. Info is, of course, in the description and on the Patreon website. So yeah, thank you guys for watching. It means a lot. Tomorrow, there's going to be another poll out to decide whether or not we're going to have poop stories or something else. So yeah, I, I feel like they're definitely creeping up in the polls more. 13%, 20%, might even win next time. Who knows? Regardless, like I said before, I am going to do it soon. So whether it wins or not, I'm going to do it. <laughs> but obviously, I'll do the one that wins. But you know, I, I probably won't put up a poll for a few days and bam poop stories. They're going to be both horrifying and hilarious, I assure you. Last time, I, I think I've done it twice, it's been incredibly funny. So that's something to look forward to if you want to fall asleep laughing, I suppose. In any case, it's time for me to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you.